A couple of years ago, my wife Janine and I, we were fortunate enough to be able to go to France. And I was excited because I was going to get to use my high school French and impress my wife with being able to talk to the waiters and the shopkeepers, and, uh, and that didn't work out so well. Uh, it was not incroyable, it was uh, très terrible, it was not very good, I did not remember very much, uh, one or two words, but the time in France was still uh, really incredible and uh, got to do some cool things. The one place we got to visit was Versailles. There's a picture of Versailles. Versailles is a palace that was built by Louis XIV back in the 17th century. And it is, uh, it is a magnificent place. The Hall of Mirrors is in there. And it's just a, the gardens are incredible. It's quite a place. And it's famous not only because it was built by uh, probably the most uh, famous French king of all, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, but because it was the site of something very important about 100 years ago. On June 28, 1919, so 101 years ago, it was there that the Treaty of Versailles was signed, which ended World War I. The treaty that ended World War I was called the Treaty of Versailles, and it was signed inside the Palace of Versailles there in France. And World War I was called The War to End All Wars. It was called The War to End All Wars. And as they signed that Treaty of Versailles in 1919, there was real optimism, real hope that that was going to be the last war ever fought on earth. That that was it. That was the last war. And that from that point on, there would never be another war. Now, it had been a very costly war because if you think about the timing, that war ended in 1918, which was at the same time of the last great pandemic that hit our world, the so-called Spanish flu that killed millions of people 100 years ago. And so the combination of World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic killed 40 million people. And the thought was, now we're going to sign a treaty, and it's going to be the end of war. And because of that, there was great optimism. President Woodrow Wilson had said, we need to form a, a, a League of Nations. And they did. They formed what was called the League of Nations. This was before the United Nations. They formed the League of Nations, which was an idea that all the countries of the world would settle their issues and settle their problems there And there would never be again war, and there would be world peace. But the Treaty of Versailles in 1918 actually sowed the seeds for World War II. Because the Treaty of Versailles had such harsh punishments for Germany, such horribly strict economic sanctions on Germany, that it led to huge resentment and anger in Germany. And that allowed a man by the name of Adolf Hitler to rise to power because of that great resentment. And as Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party rose to power because of the harsh conditions of the Treaty of Versailles, of course, then began World War II. And World War II then doubled the deaths of World War I with approximately 80 million people dying in World War II. And the idea that World War I was the war to end all wars was sadly now a historical footnote. War has been a constant in human history for unfortunately as long as there have been tribes and city-states and countries and nations. And throughout the history of humanity in the midst of warfare there have always been people working for peace, praying for peace, doing everything possible to bring peace on earth. And yet, peace has seemed forever elusive. Today's the second Sunday of Advent, and each of the Sundays of Advent has a a key word, a, a word that we celebrate on the Advent wreath. And last week, as we said, last week was hope. And the second Sunday of Advent, the word of the day, the word that we think about is peace. And specifically, we think about the coming of the one that the angels proclaim, the one that the prophets call the Prince of Peace. 
And the passages that we read every year as we've read talk about this, this Prince of Peace. And they talk about the passage from Luke where the angels brought a message to the shepherds out in the field. And, and we, we can picture this scene as the shepherds are out on this cold winter's night and suddenly the heavens are filled with angels. And it says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So what kind of peace are we talking about? What is this peace that the angels proclaimed? Because the coming of Christ did not bring an end to all wars. There have been wars for 2,000 years since the birth of Christ. So what kind of peace are we talking about? Well, Peace can mean a lot of things, and people use the word peace in a lot of ways. I've heard about young mothers who have small children who have gone and hidden in their closet for five minutes just to get a little bit of peace and quiet. Peace and quiet. I've known folks who have been the peacemakers of their family because they have siblings that don't get along. They have divorced parents who can't speak to each other, even at a family wedding. And so this person has taken on the role of family peacemaker. I've sadly known people who have tried to find peace in a bottle of pills. People who feel like the only way they can feel peace is to drink enough alcohol that they forget their troubles or forget who they are or black out. And they search for peace in a bottle. And so, peace can mean a lot of things. And not just about treaties signed between rival countries or warring countries. Peace can mean all kinds of things. And it's something that we all want internally. We want Peace in our lives, peace in our families, peace in our communities, peace in our homes. 33 years after the angels made their proclamation to the shepherds in the field, 33 years later, that baby who was born in Bethlehem, of course, had grown to be a man. And that man, Jesus, said this. We read earlier, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. Jesus said to his disciples, and he said this on the night before he went to his death, I leave you with my peace, I give you my peace, but it's not the same kind of peace as the world Offers. It's a different kind of peace. Now, we read this in the New Testament, which is written in Greek, but of course we know that Jesus usually spoke, especially to his disciples, he was Jewish, he spoke in Aramaic, which is a, a derivative of Hebrew. And so when Jesus said this in the original Aramaic or Hebrew, he probably used the word shalom for peace. If you only have ever learned one word of Hebrew, you might know that one, shalom, shalom, which means peace. But as I've mentioned before, previous years, shalom in, in Hebrew means more than just the absence of war. Shalom is a much broader word. It's a, a total well-being of the soul. It is, a, it, it is a, a well-being. That's why it's used as a greeting for hello and for goodbye, shalom, shalom. Few of you who are my age uh, might remember that there was a great song that came out in 1972. Uh, the Eagles recorded a song. I was only 12 years old, but they recorded a song called Peaceful Easy Feeling. You know? And, and it's actually hung around. Some people younger than I still <clears throat> probably know about this song. I got a peaceful, easy feeling. And I know you won't let me down, because I'm already standing on the ground. Now, I didn't know really who the Eagles were, and I didn't know what they were singing about, but I like that phrase, peaceful, easy feeling. That's what we want, don't we? We want a peaceful, easy feeling, and, and Jesus promises us 
a peace, a peace that the world can't give us, but that only he can give us. So what does that look like? What does this peace that Jesus promises look like? What is this peaceful, easy feeling that Jesus promises? Well, let's look at one verse that talks about peace, and this is Paul over in his letter to the Colossians. He says this in Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You know, I've been, you know, I've mentioned before, I've, I've started reading the Bible when I got my third grade Bible way back when, and then I got more serious about reading my Bible in middle school and high school, and then when I began to feel like I was going to become a, a pastor, I got, obviously started reading my Bible more, and then for 35 years plus, actually 37 if you add in my years as a youth director, I've been preparing messages and sermons. But the thing about the Bible is, even though you've read it over and over, and even though you've you know, studied it, there's always something fresh, and there's always something new. And I, I heard, or I discovered something new about this verse this week that I'd never picked up on before, because it has to do with the word rule there in that verse, where it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. I always heard that rule as in, you know, a king or a judge or somebody else or a parent, you know, giving you a rule or a judgment or an order. That's how I kind of heard this verse. But as I was studying this verse this week, I found out that the word there that is translated into English as rule in Greek is a sports term. It's an athletic term. It is the Greek word Brabuo, which means to be the umpire. To be the umpire. Now, they didn't have baseball 2,000 years ago. Matter of fact, most of the sports that we play uh, weren't around, uh, but they did have what we would call an umpire or a referee. Uh, We know that in the ancient uh, world, in the Roman Empire, there were many games. The most famous being the Olympics, but many other games and sporting events were held in the Roman Empire. And just like modern times, there were referees, there were umpires. And because people would argue about what was reality and and who actually won and whether they was a foul or whether somebody cheated. And it was the umpire, the referee, the official who made the judgment and said, here's the way it is. So when Paul is, and Paul often does this, Paul uses a lot of sports terminology in his letters. He talks about running the race and winning the the prize and boxing. He uses a lot of sports terms in his letters. And here he says, let the peace of Christ be the umpire of your heart. Let the peace of Christ be the umpire of your heart. Let, Let the peace of Christ make the call. And that kind of gives the whole verse a different flavor because whatever the umpire says, well, that's the way it is. If he says it's a strike, it's a strike. If he says it's a ball, it's a ball. If he says the ball crossed the goal line, it did. He, he, he makes the call. And so Paul is saying, you know, let, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Be, be, make the call. Make the call in your heart. And, and even overrule you. Because I may say, well, I, you know, I, I'm just alone. I'm all alone. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. I'm all alone. And the peace of Christ says, no, uh uh-uh, that's not the right call. You're not alone. Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, overruled. You're not alone. You know, I say, well, I'm... I'm I'm scared, and, and there's nothing I can do about it. And, and the peace of Christ says, uh-uh, that's not, that's not reality. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. You know, think about the peace of Christ being the, the umpire, the referee, the one who can say, this is reality. You know, I, I'm going to make the call here. Jesus, as we said over in John, says, I've told you these things, that you may have in me peace. In this world, 
you'll have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. You know, because we might say, well, yeah, the world is just, it's fallen to pieces. <laughs> the world is just on a, on a handcart to, you know, where. There, there's just, you know, the world has fallen apart and, 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 and there's nothing we can do about it. And Jesus, the peace of Christ in our heart says, no, overruled, because guess what? I've overcome the world. Yes, there'll be troubles. Yes, there will be troubles. You'll have trouble. There will be conflict. There will be disappointment. There'll be pandemics. There'll be, there'll be problems. But take heart because I've overcome, and you can overcome as well. Let the peace of Christ be the, the one who makes the call in your heart, the umpire, the referee of your heart. I talked about wars, and I talked about how World War I actually the treaty sowed the seeds for World War II. I read a story about a man, 1944, a man by the name of J. Stanford Staheli, who in 1944 was a prisoner of war, an American prisoner of war in Germany. American soldier, he'd been captured by the Germans, and he was now in imprisonment in Frankfurt, Germany. And what the Germans had done during World War II, they had converted a lot of other buildings into POW camps or, or prisons. And they had taken a, an old castle on the outskirts of Frankfurt, Germany, and turned this old castle into a place to hold POWs. And so Stanford was an American POW, and he was being held prisoner in this old, old castle in, outside of Frankfurt in Germany in 1944, and he had a cell there that had a barred window where he could actually look out onto the, the square of Frankfurt. And it was getting to be late December 1944, and he was in his cell of this old castle looking out and he was watching the children play in the streets of the square of Frankfurt. And he was watching them bring home Christmas trees for their families. And he was watching them bring home Christmas decorations and singing Christmas songs in, in German. And as he watched the children out there in the square of Frankfurt getting ready for Christmas, all he could think about was his own little brothers and little sisters back in Utah. And thinking about they were doing the same things. They too were decorating their homes and they too were singing Christmas songs. He thought about how these little German children, they didn't know anything about politics. They didn't know anything about world conflicts. They just were kids excited about Christmas, wanting to be in their homes at Christmas and he, he, he later wrote about this experience. He made it out, got to get home to Utah after the war. And he wrote about this experience, and this is what he wrote. He said, the next day was Christmas in Germany and all over the world. I knew in my heart that in spite of war and devastation, Christianity was still alive. The belief and hope of peace on earth and goodwill to men burned brightly in every Christian heart on this night, in remembrance of the Christ child born in Bethlehem long ago, this I learned as a prisoner of war that, Chris, that, that Christmas in the castle. You see, he had a peace that Jesus had given him that the world couldn't give him and that the world couldn't take it away. The Nazis couldn't take it away from him. The war couldn't take it away from him. The, the prison walls couldn't take it away from him. The message of the coming of the Christ child, the message of the coming of the Prince of Peace, burned in his heart even as he sat as a prisoner of war. As he watched children of the enemy <laughs> get excited about Christmas, he, he had a peace in his heart that was really beyond explanation. It was a peace the world couldn't give and a peace the world couldn't take away. 
All those many years ago, uh, in the 70s, when I was in high school, I was in the high school show choir, which wasn't nearly as cool as show choirs today, but uh, we still did stuff, and, and at Tulsa Memorial High School is where I went to high school, and, and that particular show choir ended every concert with the same song. That song was, Let There Be Peace on Earth. So no matter the time, no matter the season, every concert, back in the day at least, ended with that same song. And I think you probably know that song. Matter of fact, oh, Janine's at the piano. Look at that. Let's sing it. I love that song, but of course, one slight, not correction so much as maybe just thought about it, the peace actually begins with Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Peace begins there, and then that peace comes into our heart, and then it's, it's on us to, as that song says, let, let then that, that peace movement, that, that peace initiative, then start with us in every human relationship, in our families, in our place of work, in our schools, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, wherever we are, we are called to be peacemakers. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. We are called to make peace wherever we are. Um, For most of us, you know, what's happening in between nation states and countries is is out of most of our own control. Um, We have some input there, but in most cases, we're called to be peacemakers wherever we are. And that peace that begins with me actually begins with the peace of Christ that rules in my heart. That the peace of Christ that is the umpire of my heart, the referee of my heart that says this is the call. This is, this is reality. And so at Christmas, when we see Christmas cards and banners that say, Peace on earth, goodwill to men and women. Um, hopefully that's more than something on a Christmas card. That's a reality that we want to continue to work at every day. And it does begin in the human heart with the peace of Christ that he gives us that the world can't give us and the world can't take away from us. It is a peace that comes from walking with Christ. But it's not just this way, vertical, it's, it's horizontal too. Because that peace of Christ that comes from Him is then something that we begin to share and spread and make part of our role as 
the children of God. Because Jesus says, if you're children of God, you're a, you're a peacemaker. So, we pray for peace on earth and goodwill to men and women. Let's pray.